Hi, this is Adi Boros here for CG Masters. Let's take a look at how to think about texturing so we can... Um... <laughs> Sorry, this uh, intro music that we're trying out, it might we might not quite have got there with this yet. But anyway, uh, it's, let's take a look today at how to think about texturing so we can break down any image and then build a quick stone and marble shader. So anyway, let's get down to fundamentals first. Art could be expressed as what we see or want to express or emphasize as a whole. So knowing what to leave out of an image so as to be able to make a clear point. OK, so we've got an outdoorsy image here and it's pretty flat. There's no real sense of depth or focal point. But using contrast, we can help to introduce some attention to our object of interest. Also, using color, we could help introduce even more attention to our object. We could also attempt to describe the picture in terms of light, shape and perspective too, and how those aspects themselves might be being manipulated by contrast and color. In this building image, the pattern of the windows is pretty much all over the place. There isn't much of a pattern. It's very uh, random. So you could say it's kind of got an unusual rhythm to it. Uh, also, we could think about the context. I mean, I don't know what's happening outside of the frame here, but maybe all the other buildings that surround this one look very, very ordinary compared to this. And so that helps it stand out. I don't know really how, whether that's true or not, but it's fun to attempt to describe and pick out a story of an image and explore the mysteries there. The point I'm trying to make is we can use a similar methodical way to break down a texture. Let's take a look at this popular illusion. Up close and large, it looks like a picture of Einstein, but far away, or zoomed out to a thumbnail size, it looks like Marilyn Monroe. What's happening here is that we're only looking at the low frequencies of Marilyn Monroe and the high frequencies of Albert Einstein. So it serves us to think and try and extract these things in our mind as we look and decode an image. So let's do that to this stone texture. We can basically just blur the image to get a sense of the low frequency detail. So what we can see is a sort of random noisy image there, not a lot of contrast even between the light and the darks. Going back to the original image, we can then swap to the high frequency. So here we can see a lot of basically just white noise, but we can make sort of some of other shapes out as well. Going back to the original image, we can then try to filter out that high frequency noise just to look at the shapes and the patterns and the colors a little bit more clearly. And again, there's not a lot of contrast or definition that we can see here, but there are sort of patches of lighter color, uh, very random with distorted edges. Other things to think about are the weathering, like the dirt, scratches and uh, or cracks and maybe the material surface properties that we can see, like the highlights and shadows or how the surface reflects. So let's whiz through another couple of examples just to get a feel for all of this. This is a cowhide pattern, the sort of pattern uh, Musgrave texture is actually very good for. We also have a rust image, which is pretty similar to the stone texture in many ways. Now, just for fun, to see how this works on a regular image, I've included a picture of my daughter dressed as Spider-Man. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Uh, she hates being Spider-Man, but that's actually not true. What she's trying to do is not move her face. She's actually worried she'll ruin the face paint. But anyway, the low frequencies aren't giving us many surprises apart from you, when you can't see the face, the yellow rings are probably the main focus. The high frequency shows there isn't that much noise in the image, but we can see a lot of the defining contrasting lines. With the high frequency removed, we can get a clearer look at the standout shapes and colors. So let's use all of this way of thinking to create our stone texture. I'm starting here with the file that I'll often be starting with in these sorts of tutorials, and that's with the Cycles Prime Element shader. You don't need this to understand the texturing part, but if you then want to have that texture going into a final shader easily and quickly, then go and grab that from the link if you haven't already. By default, there's only a couple of nodes that we don't really need. We can just delete those. They're there just to show us something before we begin. So first, the low frequencies. Bear in mind that we'll be moving pretty quickly through this, but there are supporting images on the website, plus you've got access to download the blend file as well. We'll need a noise texture, default settings are fine here, and we'll then reduce the contrast by reducing the grayscale range in a color ramp node, raising the black and lowering the white. I've attached a preview there to just help indicate what's going on with those nodes. Next up, shapes. So these shapes can be got with our Musgrave texture. The key here is that we need to get that distortion happening around the edges of the pattern. So we'll take a vector out of the distortion frame and use this node to add the amount of distortion into it a little. Now we need to combine these, which I'll do with a color mix node set to add. Next, we've got the high frequencies. This is pretty easy, really, just different noise textures set to higher scale values like 40 and 60, getting tweaked through color amps. And those are being overlaid onto what we have so far. 
The next noise texture is trying to get those little bright specks of light to pop out. So we'll set the scale of the noise quite high to say something like 200. And instead of overlaying this, we just want the bright point. So I'll set this to add. To help make it pop just before this, we'll add a color ramp node and reduce the white values. So let me go through that again. On the left, we've got our first high frequency scale at 40. On, on the right, we've got the result with it overlaid onto the texture so far. Now we move forward a step and on the left now, we've got the next high frequency scale up at 60. And again, we have on the right the result. Now that didn't have enough contrast, so we're then adding a color ramp to that noise scale of 60. And again, we can see the change there on the right. Finally, we've got the scale of 200, but we just want little white specks. So with the color ramp, we can basically get that. And as they didn't feel like they were popping out quite enough, we added a color ramp to reduce the white output and give our little specks a good chance of being seen. Next up, let's add some of the weathering, specifically some scratches and crack-like details. You can grab the node group we need from here if you haven't already, and you'll find a breakdown on that too. For this though, we just need to append the blend file and then look for the right node tree. Then we can find it in the group section of our add menu. I'll take two different instances of this, plug a clean undistorted vector into both of them. The first will have quite a low scale so that the cracks are quite large. The cracks mix will be turned all the way down so they're not all joined up with each other. I'll then add a little noise so they're not perfectly straight. The second one will be very similar to the first, but I'll increase the scale here. Then these will be added together with a color mix node, then added onto the main texture. Next, I want to take this from being grayscale and give it some color. So for this, we just need another color ramp. I've pressed the plus icon on the color ramp a few times to get several flags along the ramp. Then to get our colors, we could just sample from the image using the eyedropper. I've jumped forward here, by the way, as it's just a little tedious to sit through. And my main consideration was to just keep all the brightness values of each point along the ramp about the same as it was before I started tweaking them. Next, we'll add in more weathering. We'll need two color sets on the object to make use of this. The grunge section requires an AO bake called Call AO. This is how the current bake looks in the viewport. Let's take another look at rendered mode, but just this grunge section. The top color ramp can squeeze out the black fade so that it's tighter and the next color ramp down can control the uniformity of this if you want breaks along it and so on. I'll then simply multiply this onto our texture. The next and lower part of the weathering is for worn edges. The two color ramps here do the same as the ones for the grunge. The upper one can tighten the spread and the lower one can add in variation. I'll then add this into our overall texture and then we can call it done. To finish the shader though, we'll need a vector bump node to go into the vector sockets of everything. We'll use the low frequency and the main shapes and plug that into the height and then set the strength value. So going over that again, this is our low frequency and shapes that we're using as our height map for the bump node. And before we use this as a bump map, this is the current look of the shader. And this is how it looks when we plug it in. For a little high frequency bump, I'll use the middle of the three noise textures. So the one which is set to 60 in the scale and overlay that into what we've already got going into the height socket. And we'll just overlay it just a tiny amount. So let's illustrate and break that down again. We have some high frequency scale that we want to use in our bump. We have what we're using so far. And then we overlay the high frequency a tiny amount. This is the final bump map without any diffuse textures. And this is the final result with the textures and bump. Now let's take a look at the reflection. First, the roughness. Not much of this will be very mirror-like, so we know we'll need to rough that up a bit. This node controls how much edge reflection we're getting, which is plugged into the second socket. The first socket that looks close to black is how shiny this object is overall, which as it's stone isn't much, and so close to zero or black. That's it, our stone shader is finished. To change this to marble, it's actually really easy. I'll use shift control D instead of just shift D to duplicate the reflection frame which maintains all its connections coming into it. Next, I want a smooth surface, so I'm not going to need bump for this, so I'll unhook all those. I'll make this marble green, so I'll use a color mix node at the very end to overlay green onto everything. Set the roughness really low so that we can get close to a mirror-like reflection here and I'll set the amount of additional edge reflection right up. 
The first socket of the reflection mask is still close to black and darker colors here means that the mixed shader will lean towards the diffuse and light colors will be shinier and use the gloss shader more. So we'll brighten this up a bit more. Finally, this is how it looks with an environment image so you can see more interest in the reflections there. Don't forget there's more info on the main page and let me know of any textures you managed to break down and then build back up in cycles. Have fun, connect with us, and until then... That didn't work, is it?